Um, I was asked to, to give 10 lessons that I learned the hard way in China. I'm going to give 11. Um, first, I beg you, please use a purchase order and have that purchase order chopped. Also, it should be in, in both languages. Reason being, um, if something goes wrong and you don't have a contract in place, even if the courts in China want to help you, your, their hands are tied. So you've got to have a contract. Don't place an order by saying, okay, we've got an email confirmation, I'm going to send some money, that should be enough. No. Get a purchase order. And if you don't have a purchase order template, I'll, let me introduce my Chinese lawyers that I've used, and for a few hundred dollars, they'll write you a template in both languages that you can use over and over and over again when you're sourcing in China. So please get a template. As I mentioned before, when Financial fr friction happens, meaning the buyer and seller want to sue each other. It's usually over quality or lead times. So they miss the lead time, you can't sell it, now you've missed the orders. How do you protect yourself? In that purchase order, state the expected lead time and a penalty for missing it. Early on in my career, I used to get a lot of calls at the 11th hour. Mike, we're good friends, so you'll understand that because I got a bigger order from Disney, I can't ship your small order on time, so I'm going to be late a month, Mike. And because my contract wasn't clear about the penalty, I kind of had to take it. Nowadays, when the suppliers call me up, I said, hey, Mr. Lee, no problem. Look, I built a couple weeks in there just to be safe anyways. But also, the contract says that every fifth day that you're late, I get 2.6% off. So hey, take a couple weeks. <laughs> Surprisingly, somehow it ships on time the next day. So have a, a proper contract that states the lead times and penalties for missing it. It's not enough to say, it has to ship on the 15th. You need to say what are the penalties if it doesn't ship, ship on the 15th. Um, if you're worried about intellectual property, at least have some type of plan contractually about what is respected in terms of a non-compete clause. It's outside of today's presentation. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. If you can't make it tomorrow, leave your card at the desk because I'm going to videotape it as well and I'll be happy to send it. So if you're worried about intellectual property, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, another lesson I, I learned is we're so excited to come to China and place the order that we forget to ask, what happens if there's a problem? What happens if the product doesn't quite conform? Is the factory going to send replacements? In my going on 7, 15 now, almost 17 years in China, never once have I had a supplier that missed the lead time say to me, Mike, our bad, we're sorry, let us pick up the FedEx and send it to USA. It, at the supplier's expense, never once, until I started putting it in my contract. Now I have suppliers that they pick up the bill when they miss the lead times. All right, as I mentioned before, know that even if your supplier is telling you that they have global insurance coverage, that if there's ever a product defect or a, a recall or it hurts somebody, that they're, they'll take care of it. You're the importer of record. If, the, if some little child is hurt with your product in your country, the lawyers are not going to try to sue some factory overseas with no assets in your country. They're going to come after you first. So it is your responsibility to make sure that the product is safe and complies to your standards in your given country. So know your risk as the importer of record. Um, this one's a little bit technical, but if you're dealing with something that is custom made, you'll own the tooling outright. The tooling is like the molds and the, the equipment that is used to make your product. If your product is unique, you want to own the, the method for making the product, the tool, the injected mold, whatever, so that if that factory does do you wrong, you can pull the means of production away and go somewhere else. Um, I've had cases where I've brought in local attorneys and local police into a factory saying, here's the contract. My customer owns that tooling. We're taking it away. And we pulled it. I've also had because the, my customer hired me after the problem, I've also gone into factories on my hands and knees begging them to give me the tooling that my customer thought that they own but doesn't really own. And believe me, it's, it's a lot more fun to go in when you have the contract and the police with you than just begging and negotiating to try to get um, the tooling out of a factory that really doesn't value your relationship anymore. Long story short, if the tooling or molds are important to you, own them. Okay. Appropriate legal jurisdiction, I guarantee you ask your lawyers back home, what jurisdiction should I put on this contract with my Chinese supplier? That New York lawyer is going to tell you New York State. Why? Because if something goes wrong, he wants to get paid. In reality, um, you could win a court case in the U.S. It has no bearings because a, a Chinese court of law just ignores it. There's no bilateral treaty 
where a court case in US or Europe or any country, maybe outside of Hong Kong, even Hong Kong has some trickiness to it, can be enforced in China. So my rule of thumb is put the jurisdiction where the supplier has assets. The good news is the playing field is a lot more level than in the past, meaning the Chinese courts will actually, if you have a good contract, um, they'll be unbiased. They, they, Ten years ago, foreigners never won in a Chinese court of law. Now, as China's joined the World Trade Organization, believe me, the balance has changed a little bit. It's more level. But you got to have a clear contract. Um, I talked about bilingual payments linked to performance. What I mean is um, the best way to protect yourself from having quality problems is dangle the payments here, but it, do the product inspection. For example, under the 30 40 30. 30% deposit after an audit to make sure the factory's legit. 40% happens after the product inspection before it's about to ship. So you tell the supplier, okay, when it's ready to ship, let me know. I'm gonna fly over to China or I'm gonna send my representative or a third party is gonna come in and do the product uh, inspection and bam, you get paid either the second payment or, or the final payment. But without that, without linking their performance, meaning meeting quality or lead times, Structuring your payments to 30, 40, 30 has no protection for you unless there is some kind of quality gain or performance check in there. Um, we talked about asking for a written quality plan. It's my belief that if you don't, if you're not explicit in what you want to buy, you will get exactly what you didn't order. What I mean is, if this watch, if it's important to have this gray, I'm sorry, this brown color band and a certain mechanics to it. You better write that down and attach it to the contract, and even better, review the, the quality manual of the factory so that they are checking to make sure that it's a blue band and a certain mechanic. Because if you don't write it down specifically, um, you may not get it at all. And my bonus, my bonus lesson is please make sure that the name on your contract matches the name on the bank account and matches the name on the factory gate. This safety measure alone would have prevented all the scams that we talked about earlier today. So make sure that you've got a contract in Chinese, the bank address is the same as the contract address, and it's ideally the same address as the factory that you visited. That can save you thousands or tens of thousands of dollars right there. Okay, um, I told you that I would not plug my company, but I didn't say anything about a shameless plug in my book. So there's 300 pages available on Amazon of all the templates and checklists that we talked about. Um, so if, if that's of interest to you, you can go online to chinasourcinginfo.org.book and uh, there it is. Now, before we move to question and answer, and I hope you'll make me look good for the last five minutes, um, if you remember just three things. One, find the right supplier. What I mean is, don't fly over here to China, hope that you found a good supplier, place the purchase order, and then later start to second guess, well, were they, did they really understand my quality concerns? Are these guys a legit company? I didn't visit the factory. You're here. Spend the time to visit the factory or the, even a trading company, but make sure that they're the right partner for you. It's such a waste of money to come over here, place the purchase order, then find out uh, we have to start again because they've never made this product. Um, if you can't afford audits, inspections, all those things we talked about for a couple hundred bucks, you really shouldn't be buying from China. It's another way of saying it is do it right or don't do it. Um, it's just such a dangerous place if you don't source safely, it's dangerous. But if you follow the lesson, the tools we talked about, China can be very safe. So if you're, if you're going to go in, just be risky and gamble, go to Macau, as I said. And as, for the second time, I'm gonna say it because it's so important, Make sure that the name in Chinese is the same on the contract, the factory address, and the bank account. Um, in your handout, there's a list of resources, but let me give you my favorites before we go to Q&A. Um, my blog for small buyers is at the China Sourcing Information Center. My blog for buyers who purchase over $2 million per year is that advanced buyer blog at PSS China. That those. Uh, Companies that are listed on the blacklist is supplier blacklist. I read that every day. And if you do need help, all of the um, companies that I, I have used for inspection, for lawyers, for engineering. So I'm a sourcing agent, but often I, maybe I need a lawyer or maybe I need a logistics company. I listed all the companies that I wrote in a ballpark of what they charge on that handout. And um, I'll make an introduction to any of them via the Sourcing Service Center. Also, we're down at booth number 10, Hall 10, 
row L35 will be hanging out there for the rest of the show. We went over a few minutes, but um, they'll let me stay for some question and answer. So on that note, um, I wish you successful sourcing. I'd be happy to uh, do my best to answer any questions you might have at this point. All right. Great. We have one, one question to start. Hello, Mark and Dorothy from Australia. Thank you so much, firstly. For such an informative and valuable presentation. Really, that was extraordinary. Thank you. I've, I've made a lot of mistakes and crazy <laughs> enough to tell you about it, so most of the stuff are my Marvelous. mistakes. <laughs> Thanks for all your mistakes. Um, just one question, a simple one. You'd, uh, number one on your list of 11 was use a purchase order, and then you had chopped. What do you mean by get it chopped? I'm okay, sorry uh, if that sounds No, no, that's simple. I, yeah, I should have had a sample of it. Um, in China, a signature doesn't doesn't represent even a person, let alone a corporation. So each company, like sometimes in, in Australia or America, you would have a seal where you it, it give an impression on a really important document. Well, something similar is a chop. It's a red, usually circular in mainland China and rectangular in Hong Kong. And whoever has that, regardless of what signature is on there, whoever has that chop represents the factory, and that that's law. So, um, for example. I had an employee once that uh, thought he was dismissed unfairly. He wasn't. And um, he made a copy of my chop thinking that he was going to blackmail with me with it. That's a real no-no, and he, he went to jail for two years when I told the police. So this chop, it's like that's the, if you have that, you control the company. So if it's not on the document, then say your factory doesn't adhere to this contract that you signed with Miss Lee, the sales girl. Yeah, so the court's going to say, all right, bring Miss Lee in. Does she have any assets? Is she, she's an employee, but she's not an ownership in the company? So get the chop. Many 